going to move on to the next section of the heel portion of our day's events and have a talk from Rocky Tishma. Rocky is a marriage and family therapy student at Antioch University in New Hampshire. In addition to being a co-founder of ctsurvivors.org, Rocky is also taking an empirical approach toward creating therapeutic treatments for individuals and families injured by spiritual trauma and specifically by conversion therapy. Having been through conversion therapy himself, Rocky has found that there was little to no help for those suffering from the damages of conversion therapy and decided to join the forces in paving the way forward. Rocky, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, again, my name is Rocky Tishma. I am really new to this game. Um, I went through conversion therapy about 23 years ago. And for the last 22 years, um, I had compartmentalized it and stuffed it down. Um, I did, didn't talk about it. I didn't think about it. But it was there. It was looming. It was something. Um, and about a year ago, I woke up having night terrors, um, just screaming, just, just not good, having memories, flashbacks of what had went down um, when I was when I was going through uh, conversion therapy at 16. Uh, so a little bit about my story is, I was 16 years old, I was uh, brought up LDS, uh, Mormon, and uh, church was my life. Uh, I would go to, in high school, I was going to church every day before school, church classes. After school, I was in scouts and part of the community stuff. And um, it was it was basically like my family away from my family. Um, it was a it was it was my life. It wasn't part of my life, and God was a big part of my life. Um, but God and I were not understanding each other because for the last three to four years, I knew, probably around twelve, thirteen, I knew I was gay, and um, and I knew it was it was wrong and sick and bad, and. Um, so I would pray every night, God, please just take this away, make me straight, just why, why me, please help me. And, um, and he never answered, God never answered. And um, as I got older and puberty starts hitting and, and 16 rolls around in high school and emotions and libido and all of that, my grades start dropping and I went from being um, a perfectionist because as long as everything is perfect and as long as you have straight A's and everything is good, no one, will be able to see that there's a problem. Um, but I couldn't keep it up anymore. And uh, I came home one night and uh, my report card had came home in the mail and I had like all C's and D's and my mom came and she's like, you, you disappoint me. And, and that was it. And I was like, you know what? I can't be a disappointment anymore. Um, because if they knew, if they knew I was gay, then that would be the ultimate disappointment. So um, I decided, I decided to, 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 to end it. And I went up to my parents' uh, bedroom and uh, I found a bottle of pills and I just thought, you know what, I'm done. I'm done. And I, I took them and I went to bed. Um, I woke up the next day in the hospital. Um, luckily, my mom had came in to get me up for school the next day and, and found me and they rushed me to the hospital and when I came to and, and like came out of it, I guess that I had outed myself while I was um, intoxicated on the bottle of pills I'd taken. And, um, and my mom's response was, I know, I've known, and I, I love you. But that wasn't enough um, because that's not the message I was hearing from my other family, my church family. That's not the message that I had been told that God wanted from me. So I, I got out of the hospital and within that week, I went to my, my bishop and um, he sent me to a church licensed therapist through family services in the church. And um, within one week of, of trying to kill myself, I was in a therapy session where they said, that voice that says you're wrong, that voice that says you're broken, that voice that says you're bad, that is God. And that's a good voice and listen to it. Um, because if you don't listen to that voice, if you, if you act on these feelings, um, you will end up nothing more than, than a sexual deviant. You will die of AIDS. Uh, your family will abandon you. You'll never see them again and you won't go to heaven. And, um, 
I didn't want to let anyone down. And so I did what I could and I, I started doing it. And um, I, was a, I was a student at a performing arts high school. I was really talented. I am really talented, how about that? Um, and, uh, and they told me maybe you should quit the performing arts school because there's a lot of homosexuality going on around there at an art school and maybe that's making you gay. And so they tried to take my dream away from me, my, my, my goals. And um, like a lot of people before me today have talked, hope, they started taking hope away. Um, and I became hopeless again. And luckily, luckily I have a mom who spoke up and came to me and said, you look like you did that night that you made that bad decision. And I love you no matter what, but I don't, don't want to lose you. And she saved my life. And I went, I went to the bishop and I went to the therapist and I said, I can't do this anymore. It's not me. I, 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 I've tried. And they're like, well, then you're not worthy of God's love. And um, you're not worthy of this church family. And um, the ostracization that you get when you are um, excommunicated or they start the excommunication process, that is the most awful feeling because it breaks, it, it breaks you off from any connection. Um, and that's, that's what I want to do now uh, with my life is I want to teach people how to reconnect. So I guess that will take me into sharing uh, my screen. So, oh, so finishing my story. Oh my gosh, sorry. Um, so I, I came out, um, got excommunicated, and with the, within a year, I was a um, hardcore drug addict and um, off the deep end and numbing everything about every feeling I had. And um, that went on for most of my uh, young adult life. And around 25 is when I got sober. Um, that's another reason why I'm trying to help be part of this ending conversion therapy is because um, trauma and addiction go hand in hand. And it's, it's a painful, painful option. Um, suicide or numb it. Um, and that's, those are the two options that I see a lot of people choose after conversion therapy. And um, I just want people to know they're not alone. So long story short, I got sober. I blamed all of my life's problems on my addiction. I was born an addict, so I must be an addict. Let me get sober. Um, and then I had that little message in the back of your head, unless you are married, you're nothing. So then I found a partner, I got married, we adopted two kids, and I became basically like a gay version of a Mormon. Um, and that internalized homophobia like was rampant, rampant. I, I did not like the gays. Um, the only thing about gay about me was in my bedroom. Um, and so that was another miserable 10 years. And then uh, my husband chose to leave me. And that abandonment was another, another jab. It was the exact same feeling that I felt when I got excommunicated because it was a compound injury on that trauma. And it was on a trauma that I had never been able to heal from. So um, that brings us to today. I woke up about a year ago again, started having all these flashbacks, all these memories, realizing, oh my God, this is all connected. And um, so I started looking, let me find some help. Let me find some, some people that have been through conversion therapy. And there are so many organizations that are trying to stop it, a conversion therapy. They're trying to end it. Um, they're making a noise and they're making a scene, but there's nowhere for the survivors. And that is when I reached out and I started on Facebook in groups. I'm like, help me, help me. And Matt, Matt Ashcroft, who spoke earlier, he reached out to me and said, wow, like what's, what's going on? And he introduced me to, to Dr. Ferguson, Michael, and we together decided let's make a place for us. Um, and we did. And we made con uh, CT survivors, which is a group of survivors supporting survivors and they were able to help me get to a place where I was well enough to re-enroll in grad school go back to finish my education and now I get to move forward and to help people and that's going to bring me to my um, my PowerPoint 
we can see this, right? We're all good. All right. So um, the idea that I have is called Hear Me Heal. With trauma, we are taught like our bodies, I guess, just keep it inside. We don't want to let it out. It's, it becomes this part of us. Um, and it's not until you can share trauma and, and let it out in a safe environment that you can start to heal from it. So um, I started talking with Michael a lot about this and, and bouncing ideas. And he would be like, yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. And, and just the support, just that ear of someone saying, yes, you're doing something good is so powerful. And that's what I want to put into this. So um, conversion therapy though is not, it is not an individual isolated event. It is an insidious disease. It's an insidious trauma that goes through the whole family. Um, what the therapist typically will do is they create unsubstantiated narratives of the family system. They tell us that your mom was overbearing they put the blame on the dad for not being there enough. Um, all of this starts to create these triangulations, these, these blame games, these back and forth, where it's breaking at the fabric of the family unit. Um, all of this will then in turn create a double bind and we'll get to what a double bind is here in a minute. So blame, blame is assigning responsibility for a fault or wrong, that's the definition. But in the psychology world, um, blame, is also known as projection. And projection is a defense mechanism that you use when you're in danger and it's not healthy. And so when you're going to a conversion therapist and they're assigning blame and they're assigning projection, that, that is not something that a, a licensed educated therapist would do. So it, right here, you can kind of see where there's a lot of trauma that is just, just beginning with the whole idea of what conversion therapy is. Um, shame. Brene Brown is like uh, my spirit animal. So um, she defines uh, shame as the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and then therefore unworthy of love and belonging. Something we've experienced, done, or failed to do makes us unworthy of connection. So if the person going through conversion therapy is anything like me, you tell yourself on a daily basis, I'm broken. I'm broken and how do I change this? And then you go to conversion therapy where they, they tell you, you're right, you are broken. And it creates this shame that you cannot get out of. And this shame starts to, starts to kill any bit of hope that you have for the future. Um, the therapy, like conversion therapy, how it creates a double bind. A double bind is basically like, it's, it's where there is no answer. So if, if the person going through conversion therapy, they can blame their mom and, they bl and then, let me take that back, I'm sorry. So the person going through conversion therapy, they're told that if they are worthy and they work hard enough, that they will heal. But then they're told, that if they work hard enough, that they will heal. So then when, when the, the therapy doesn't work, they're told that it didn't work because they didn't try hard enough. So now they're also, they go, the therapist will go in and also tell the parents, if your child is not fixed, it's the child's fault. The child is told that if you, you are feeling these things and you are feeling homosexual tendencies because of your parents' inability to either be a good dad or, or an overbearing mother. So this double bind is a trap that the family is now caught in. That's what I was trying to get at, I apologize. So um, the family, this is where the family starts to blame each other, blame themselves. Other members of the family, if you have siblings, they're now being left out. They're being affected because all of the attention is being put on the, um, the person going through this. And it is basically just this, this this place of entropy, this place where the family cannot come back. So using systems theory and using family therapy techniques, um, three types of therapy that would be very helpful in a family that has suffered conversion therapy 
One of them is EFT, which is emotion focused therapy. This is a, a form of therapy that works on um, insecurities and distance. It, it teaches a family how to communicate, how to stop communicating with defense mechanisms and how to communicate with feelings and emotions. IFS is internal family systems. This is for forgiveness and letting go. This is where you as an individual can work um, through guided meditations to go in to the old versions of you that made these choices, that made these, these, these damaging effects. See that that is all that you could do at that time. Forgive that version of you and let that go. And then third is restorative justice. And this is one of the most exciting parts um, of what I've found in the last little while. Um, Dr. Ferguson here kind of uh, turned me on to restorative justice. So basically what happens is after making sure that the individual or the family is ready for a form of uh, restorative justice, it is, a, it is a type of group therapy where you invite the individual and the family that has been harmed by conversion therapy. And then you bring in either an ex-conversion therapist um, or a uh, someone who has realized or come to the conclusion that what they were doing was harmful. You allow the victim to tell their story, to share their pain and share their trauma. And you allow the, 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 the ex-therapist to listen, understand, and forgive, almost as a, like a foster therapist, to sit into the place of the person that had harmed the individual in the first place. Um, this is going to create an environment of letting out pain, um, telling your story, sharing your truth, and then someone who has also, who has harmed others, being able to apologize to you and take accountability and responsibility for their actions. It not only helps the, the individuals that have gone through this, but it also helps the person, the, the, the conversion therapist that maybe realized how many lives that they've hurt. Um, so it is an all around like win-win. Um, another thing that we would do as a family therapist is to shine a light on unspoken family rules. Um, these are things like appearance or keeping up with the Joneses. Value, what values do we have placed? Like, how do we gain value? So growing up, your parents might not say it, but you as a kid, you, are, you know, I need to get married. I need to have 3.5 kids. I need to have a white picket fence. And if I don't do this, then I'm not of value. So once we can define and shine a light on these family, unspoken family rules, we can change the rules and we can put the power back into the family to reunite and come together. This brings me to faith. So for me, faith is a very big thing. Spirituality is huge. I, after conversion therapy, I lost my faith and I lost my spirituality. And I, and I feel that, that a lot of people that have gone through it also have. Um, and so being able to heal and open up to that, 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 the feeling of faith and spirit and, and wholeness that you had before conversion therapy is going to also help the family to heal as one. So this is where um, I would like to try and create a retreat for families. Um, it's called Hear Me Heal Retreat. We're going to use evidence-based therapeutic retreat for individuals and families healing from religion using a holistic uh, approach where we would use um, exercise and, and different types of body work that can release trauma that's held in the muscles. Using education, teaching people of what, like, what happened, where did we go wrong, what what happened in that therapeutic room that broke the fabric of our family. Spirit, allowing a family to regain control of their spirituality and not have to be told what their spirituality should be. And then the most important part of this is, is if we are healing as families and we're healing as families with other families around, we can become a network of surviving families. And being able to lift each other up is, is, is priceless. Um, so um, 
if you take anything away from, from what I've talked about here, it's unconditional love. Unconditional, not subject to any conditions. Love, any intense feeling or deep affection. But I didn't really learn a lot on my way through life. I learned most by being able to stop and look back. So if you look back at unconditional love, you see that it's an intense feeling of deep affection, not subject to any conditions. And so just for unconditional love, um, if someone comes to you and says, whether you're a pastor, a priest, a bishop, a friend, a mom, a dad, and someone tells you that someone came out of the closet and what should I do? You just love them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rocky. Let's see, let's do virtual snaps. We will have a question and answer session where we'll be able to engage with Rocky following our next presenters here. Next up, we have Adam and Paulette Trimmer.